Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Autistic Tidbits and Tangents podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Tony Atwood, and we are going to be discussing changes in the autism discourse. Uh, so, good topic, because <laughs> there has been enormous... I am old, and I remember <laughs> the 1970s. Yes, I was there. So I've been through it. I'm a time traveler. Absolutely. <laughs> Welcome to Autistic Tidbits and Tangents. Candid conversations between autistic off-hour professionals. <laughs> cool. Today's episode contains a substantial list of trigger warnings. So they are autism myths, um, discussions of misdiagnosis, the use and discussion of the Asperger's label, um, in context, um, prejudice of and from neurotypicals, discussion of, uh, discussion of gender identity and sexual identity, um, as well of, as discussion of slurs, both in, in that context and um, autism identities. Uh, one cursey word and mentions of the author who must not be named. And Tony, you your career does span many, many years by now, uh, which... Uh, 51. I'm quite happy to say that. 51 years. Wow. 51 years. I'm 70, and it's 51 years. Yeah. And have wow. you been in the same field the whole time? Has this been your passion area? Since I was 19. Wow. Yeah. What, what originally got you interested in the field of autism? Well, I wanted to be a, a psychologist since I was about 14. And I just read a lot of uh, books that you shouldn't read at 14 years old. Uh, <laughs> Freud's Psychopathology of Everyday Life, Analysis of... I was 14. Uh, and I also used to do... Uh, I made my own inkblot tests and thematic <laughs> apperceptions oh, oh. and assessed my friends at school. They still are my friends. Um, and <laughs> How so you manage I that? Really, wow. <laughs> yeah, I immersed myself, but didn't know which branch to go into. And mm. I'd done a first-year psychology degree. And my then girlfriend's mother said, Tony, you're studying psychology. Uh, we need someone to be a volunteer at a local special school. This was Longmore Special School, Sutton Coalfield in, in, in the UK, in the Midlands. And I thought, OK, fine, I'll go. And it was there that I, I met many children with intellectual disability, uh, Down syndrome and, and so on. But in the class that I was allocated were two autistic children, Russell and Sarah, uh, Russell was seven, Sarah was five. Both were classically autistic as we knew autism then. This is how time changes. Hmm. Our concept of autism was a non-speaking, high support needs, special school, then usually off to an institution. Now, the school, Mrs. Spicer, who was uh, a wonderful head, recognised with uh, Sarah, who was five in particular, that in the classroom, she was overwhelmed by the noise, the actions and all that. She really shut down. And, and that's a classic autistic feature. Can't cope, shut down. Mm -hmm. And But they knew that when the other children were out in the playground, she would relax in the classroom. So when they were all out, they would then work with her without any distractions, which I thought was really good. I now know how good that idea was. But they then said she needs to use the playground equipment. And... Uh, I, they said, Tony, could you just supervise her? Uh, she had no speech, very much in a world of her own. Um, but I didn't know anything about autism. Um, and so I just talked to her. I knew she couldn't talk back, uh, but I wanted integrity and respect. I would chat to her. I had a, a sister the same age. Uh, and so I would chat to her in, and talking about things and so on. And I knew she couldn't reply, but I thought, OK, we'll have a connection somehow. She loved being on a swing. I now know why swings and autism it's, it's rhythm and what happened was that she was on the swing really enjoying it sort of wriggled to me I want to get off so I stopped the swing off she got to wander around and I thought oh, I'll just sit on the swing and she was wandering around and she came up behind me and pushed me on the swing mm. oh. and I thought that's connection 
Yeah. That That's is you only did that to help me, mm. to push me on the swing, because I've just been pushing you oh. on the swing. And that was it. Uh, that was my whole future in a flash, in less than a second, of where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. I wanted to find out more about the difference. Russell was very disturbed by various things. He would love to just sift sand and, and play in water, but hated socialising. Now, the other kids, it was the other way around. Playing mm -hmm. in sand for hours on end would be boring. They would want socialising. He didn't. These were two kids that looked like any other kid, but were in a world of their own. So I went back to uni to start the second year and decided, OK, I'll read all that I can on autism. And I did. Within about four weeks, I had read every journal article uh, and book. There's only about three books uh, on autism. And I've kept up to date ever since. What happens now, in every year, there are at least 7,000 research studies published on autism. I can't read them all. Mm. I try to. I read about 2,000 a year. And what happens is that we've we've changed our concept but at that time autism was uh, a very conspicuous profound disability but the conceptualization was that it was an expression of schizophrenia or psychosis or caused yeah. by uh, refrigerator mothers mm -hmm. who yeah. couldn't show affection to their uh, children and so mums were told you've caused your child's autism because you don't love them enough and mm -hmm. if you love them more they would come out of their shell because you can't see anything physically that's different. And so it was a horrendous time for parents because professionals were saying they need to go into an institution, put them in an institution and have another child and try and forget them. And that was the attitude. Yeah. And of course, it, it was equally horrendous, um, the, the attitudes and, and the experience for autistic people being effectively told you know you're you're not a real person we're just gonna put you away it is but th this is my uh, a personal thought here mm -hmm. uh and i would love research to be conducted on this mm -hmm. uh asd level three those who don't speak my conception of this is a mind body division and inner mm -hmm. thoughts and language is occurring but they can't put their brain into gear with their body to speak, also to use gesture. That's odd mm. because any a child who's deaf and, and so on will use phenomenal, poetic, uh, eloquent gestures to replace the lack of speech. But in autism, you don't. And this is where I think a lot of silent, aloof autistic kids are observers. Mm. And there's a lot going on inside but they can't control their body to communicate. Now, I'm hoping that one day we'll be able to make that connection and mm -hmm. they will have some horror stories of experiences from abuse, of all forms of abuse that will occur. Mm -hmm. But the view is if the person can't speak, they can't tell you, tell anyone what's been happening. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes I've been involved with all sorts of horrendous abuse that's only been discovered by somebody actually coming across it rather than the autistic child being able to explain. Mm. So uh, it was horrible in, in many ways, but I Absolutely. often look in the eyes of an autistic level three person and I see intelligence. I don't see um, mm -hmm. stupidity or anything like that. Mm. But I try and wonder what it would be like if I had my thoughts and couldn't control my body to communicate. Mm. That would be very, very difficult. No wonder there's such horrendous, challenging behaviour. Because behaviour oh, is the no. only form you can use to communicate. The mannerisms have a message and you have mm -hmm. to translate them. But that was our view of, of autism in the 70s, either yeah. uh, defective parents or an expression of schizophrenia, psychiatric hospital. So for those who today would say Asperger's ASD level one, they mm -hmm. would be sent off to psychiatric hospitals because they were schizophrenic. Wow. Or presumed to be. Yeah. They were presumed to be because the the withdrawal is similar to the prodromal stage of schizophrenia, mm. the lack of eye contact, the sensory sensitivity. You can understand the similarities with schizophrenia from a naive point of view. However, I will say this, this problem has not gone. And I still see today young adults who have been misdiagnosed as schizophrenic. 
Yeah. And they're yeah. not schizophrenic. They're yeah. autistic. No, and, um, and sometimes it takes many years and many discover. wrong diagnoses. So yeah. a lot of women get diagnosed with BPD and, and other things on, on their route to eventual diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- this is one, again, my concerns is the amount of training that psychiatrists and to a certain extent psychologists have yeah. in autism, because autism occurs in many areas of uh, mental health issues in not yes okay we will have depression and anxiety but other areas too eating disorders and so on um substance abuse so that people need to be aware that those uh people that they're seeing there is a probability that autistic individuals are going to come their way yeah Mm -hmm. and now that you mentioned it um of course we have cleared with you that it's okay to ask but uh you mentioned substance abuse and that makes me think of uh, your son. <laughs> ah, well, who, yeah. <laughs> yeah, who was late diagnosed as autistic, which some people, I guess, would think, oh, it's it's weird that you didn't see that he was autistic growing up. But of course, our, our perception of Asperger's syndrome, which is his diagnosis, was so different when he was a child and has changed yes. quite a lot in the intervening years. Yeah. Um, he was actually diagnosed when he was on parole um, for um, armed robbery related to getting money for drugs and so on. Yeah. So he, he spent two years in prison. And he's actually written a book to help mm. autistic individuals cope with prison. It was very brave yeah. of him because when you read it, prison is a horrendous environment. And he was literally traumatized by the whole process and feared for his I life. Um, now, when he was young, Will was born in 82. And at 82, we were still considering autism in terms of silent aloof, special needs, etc. Uh, not very good socially. And he was different in the term that he had quite a few friends. Mm. When we look back now, a lot of those friends were people who admired his audacity, his sense of humor. And for many, autistic individuals, they don't get praise or compliments from their peer group. If if they're socialising well, they don't tell them that. However, you do know you're socialising well Mm -hmm. if people laugh. Mm -hmm. And that's your positive praise for your social. So he became a comedian and knew what the other kids were being audacious with the teachers and and being critical and things like that. So he was popular for that reason. So he had friends and and physically he was very good. He would do roller skating and so on. Um, So he had friends. He was succeeding well at school. Sensory sensitivity was there, but it wasn't a major issue for him. His interests, yes, he was very excited about what he was looking forward to and very disappointed when he got it that, okay, what have I got to look forward to now? So there were no clear indicators of of autism at the time. Now, when he in was in the diagnostic no, context, in our understanding of autism. Yeah. No, if we'd yeah. have said is autistic, I'd have genuinely said, and I wasn't the only one. Anyone else would say, no, not yeah. autistic, as how we conceptualized it at the time. No yeah. changing. So um, the problem was that at the age of about 12, 13 or so, as many uh, autistic autistic individuals will have, with the onset of puberty, there's not a deluge, it's a tsunami of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And the anxiety really hit him badly, still does to this day. His problem isn't autism, it's anxiety. He is autistic, yes, but his daily problem is anxiety and he learned to Mm -hmm. self-medicate with drugs. Now, the diagnosis occurred that because of his uh, problems of anxiety and addiction, we focused on that. That was the, yeah, I suppose, the priority. How do we yeah. cope with this anxiety? The and sometimes ma- marijuana, he's tried every time. Yeah, and, and, so and sometimes it's very difficult to see autism when there are these very obvious um, other issues that, that are much more in the forefront. So if yes. someone does have profound anxiety and substance abuse um, issues, then it's very difficult to actually see the autism because 
the focus is on remediating the more immediate yes, it is. As a matter of expediency, we had to alleviate his anxiety. We had to mm -hmm. find ways. What we found is that uh, drugs are the only thing that actually alleviate his anxiety. And you can't imagine life without drugs. Mm -hmm. But the diagnosis occurred, I was very um, uh, down about his... He was in prison. He'd done a whole range of things and, and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of difficulties. That I'd had a lot of videos that I'd taken of the kids when they were young. But I found that very difficult to cope with, that I would see the kids and Will in particular mm -hmm. as they were. And then as he is now, that was, was not easy to see that change that had occurred. But our daughter, Rosie, who's a teacher of autistic kids, um, Rosie said, Dad, Dad, let's have a, let's have a look at have a look at one of the old videos. And I said, oh, Rosie, I'm not sure because it's so heartbreaking to see Will as he used to be and, and, and so on and happy and bright and so on. And um, she said, no, no. I said, okay, you choose the year. And we chose a year uh, when Will would be about four or five years old. And mm -hmm. we sat down, the two of us, and watched it. And then we turned to each other and said, he's autistic. <laughs> yes. He mm. is. In other words, with our current knowledge, retrospectively, we can yeah. see it, but yeah. we didn't see it at the time. We didn't know that. Yeah. And so uh, we decided, yep, that's it. And we went tick, 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 tick. And when he came out on parole, uh, arranged for, not me, but uh, a, a psychologist, great respect, Winnie, um, to do the diagnostic assessment, said, Winnie, make your own decision. This is yeah. to do with me. And she confirmed uh, and she's continued support for him ever since. Mm -hmm. That was about 10 years ago. So um, we missed it. I, I'm not too sure that we'd have changed anything because he was socially very popular. Sensory mm -hmm. wasn't a problem. Even if he had been diagnosed, our focus would have been on anxiety. And mm -hmm. uh, it was so powerful. Psychological techniques only have a limited power. And this was so horrendously powerful within him. Mm -hmm. um, I can see why he turned to drugs as the only way of yeah. coping. So I've talked to him about this, about missing it. And he, he doesn't bear any crutch for me. You, you should have picked me up when I was a No, none of us did. Uh, no one did. But yeah. now that this is the whole point, our changing concept of autism and yeah. our changing understanding means that we now identify but at the time we didn't know that of course not so um, what what are some of the ways uh your understanding particularly of what was then called asperger syndrome i think it still is in some parts of the world uh it, how has the, that changed the icd system has uh has just been updated so it it is now autism spectrum disorders in level one yeah, in, in really most of the world. Ironically, in Denmark, we still haven't translated it, so we're still working on the old one. <laughs> okay, I, I really don't care what you call it. Mm -hmm. um, it's there. And, and over time, we called it schizophrenia, childhood psychosis. Then we had os aspects of uh, all sorts of things and so on. The pattern is there, but we changed the terminology. But yeah. Obviously, there are improvements and so on. Um, so, Cara, what was your question? I forgot your question. There. I, I, now I, I can't quite remember, but I think it was basically what what has changed in in the definition. How how do you think it's broadened, or what are some of the features that are there now that we weren't diagnosing, you know, 20, 30 years ago, forty years ago? <laughs> okay, I think what's happened is a lot of research, clinical experience, and so on, and autobiographies. I've learned more from autobiographies than from the research literature. Me too. On the social challenges, the ability to read faces, uh, social situations, what working out what someone is thinking and, and feeling. And we only really understand how complex socializing is when we meet someone who finds it difficult and try to teach them. And only when you try to teach them do you realize, oh, it's amazing kids are at the beach never met each other. And within two minutes, they're all playing together. And the autistic kids are saying, how do they do that? How, how do they see the green light to join? How, how do they join? How do they know when to leave, how, what, what to say? And so we suddenly realized that, that the social world is actually very complex and it requires neurological processing. It means that autistic individuals can socialize and can be very successful. However, it's a cost. 
in terms of emotional and I suppose um, brain energy in socializing because you have to process huge amounts of information. Autism mm -hmm. is associated with an ability with patterns and systems like mathematics and visualization in the arts. And so the person is then applying that skill to socializing, to look for patterns. And when you say, what are the changes? We now realize that some people do that by analyzing and camouflaging. Now, this is where I'm going to bring in Maya, because <laughs> you have been in the forefront of this with your uh, videos and so on, describing how you can socialize, but it's the cost mm -hmm. of exhaustion. Do you want to comment on that? Well, I mean, I, I, I think there are now so many more autistic voices out there about this subject and masking has really become something that that we discuss a lot today. Um, and of course, when I started making YouTube videos, uh, I, I don't think we were quite as many, at least online, because, well... I think it was like 2013, 2014, yeah. <laughs> something yeah. like that. Um, and, and so, yeah, the, the discourse just wasn't as varied, I think, as it is now. And I just remember uh, the, the video that you're referring to, of course, was actually me kind of just filming one of my breakdowns where I just... I just lost the energy to cope and I was upset about things that people had said, not necessarily that day, but just the deluge of, mm -hmm. of misinformation that people throw in your face all the time. And I just kind of filmed it. And I remember one of the things I said was, um, I'm paraphrasing, but basically I should receive an Oscar for, for playing a neurotypical <laughs> You know, that, every that has day. gone all, all over the world. Wherever I present, I, I refer to that quote. <laughs> it is it is brilliant. Yes. Uh, but just like a, an actor is so convincing, then the person has learned this is my role, this is my script. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it is an understandable reaction, but it delays the diagnosis. You don't know the real self. It, and it it's does. Fun. And and the other issue, of course, is that is that in your daily life, not just diagnostically, but in your daily life, it becomes a very invisible disability because people don't see you on your bad days. Because, of course, on our bad days, it's when we stay inside. Exactly. And um, can, can I share something personal? Is that okay? Of course. Oh, oh look, there's nobody watching this. It's okay. There's, there's nobody there. It's just, it's just the right. three of us. <laughs> Of course, of course, this is not going online. <laughs> no, 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 um, no. No, but um, Tony, we spoke a couple of days ago, mm. and you will know this. I am masking very much right now because I'm mm. I'm actually struggling right now with um, a beginning depression or and or burnout. Um, some things have happened in the course of this year that that have left me kind of unable to cope. And I'm still recording this podcast. We're actually recording this in August. This probably isn't coming out until December. So you guys won't know this, but we're recording due to scheduling conflicts <laughs> very, very early. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm struggling right now and I'm I'm masking the heck out of it because this is something that's important to me. But what you're not seeing is the flip side, is the, the energy cost that comes later. And so even those of us who present um, very neurotypically mm. or who present like we're coping, uh, we're not necessarily coping very well. And I, th I think this is not just an issue in autism, but it's also an issue when it comes to anxiety, depression, and, and many more. Mm -hmm. um, issues that, that can profoundly affect your life. People don't see the struggles because they happen in private. Mm -hmm. They do. And this may begin in childhood with what I call Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It could be perfect at school, mm -hmm. but very different in the safety of, of home. Mm -hmm. And, and what perhaps we're not, not doing... even in front of parents, but actually no. 
not showing struggles until you're alone. I never wanted to distress my parents by talking about being bullied, anything like that. So I was a very solitary problem solver and I still am. And, you know, people would not believe some of like when I hit burnout, like at work, they wouldn't believe I had people saying your house must be perfectly tidy. You're so organized. I'm like, home is a disaster. What are you talking about? You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is. So it's a superficial sociability uh, at a cost. Yeah. Uh, and that means that um, one of the reasons that, that it, it begins is to prevent bullying and teasing, um, because then you're a part of the group. But yeah. then you're promoted to positions where it's beyond your capability. Um, all sorts of things occur. So what's happened is is if we look at the, the 50 odd years that I've been involved is we've realized that order is much broader than we thought. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, recent research at the Centers for Disease Control shows that 60% of autistic individuals have an IQ in the normal range. Autism used to be associated with intellectual disability. Mm-hmm. Now that still occurs, but it's a minority. The majority will be going to an ordinary school, an unusual mm-hmm. profile of learning, but with ordinary expectations, and people mm-hmm. aren't aware of the amount of effort and uh, Mm -hmm. depletion of energy and the new concept of autistic burnout, how that affects the individual. Mm -hmm. Now, I I do remember hearing you speak a couple of years ago, and you were talking about potentially developing a tool for um, identifying girls and women. Uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on that and also on um, you know, there's tremendous gender and sexual diversity. And, and how do we how do we find everyone? How do we get people the diagnoses they deserve? OK, uh, thank you. If you go to my web page, tonyatwood.com.au, there is the resources section. And there there is a questionnaire that has been evaluated. Myself and colleagues, Michelle Garnett and a few others, decided to combine our clinical experience of when we're doing a diagnostic assessment of a woman. Uh, what are the questions? What are the concerns? What are the patterns? Is there any difference in sensory sensitivity and socializing, uh, masking, camouflaging, all those mm-hmm. sorts of things? So we decided to create a questionnaire originally for children. Uh, and that's been published and it's available on my web page, but also one for adults. And the adult one, the advantage of that, it has a cutoff score. And that can be used to legitimize a referral for diagnostic assessment. It doesn't replace a diagnostic assessment. It just legitimizes it. And what people say when they're filling it in is, ah, you're asking questions no other professional has asked me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I can see the pattern that's going on here. So Mm -hmm. it has been evaluated and and it's now an accepted screening instrument. Uh, University College London have just uh, published a camouflaging questionnaire, Ooh. which is fascinating because we're now I, I, we send those on before we see the person, and, and I'm amazed at how the person admits so readily how they succeed. So, oh yeah, I do it this way and I do it that way and so on. Mm-hmm. And a, a friend and colleague of mine, Julie Cook, has done her PhD, second PhD at University College London, is how camouflaging occurs. And what she did was fascinating, where she had somebody who autistic camouflages, and they had a conversation with a friend of hers. Uh, And that was videotaped. And then afterwards, she and the autistic woman uh, watched the video and said, where are you camouflaging? Mm -hmm. You couldn't tell. You couldn't tell. It was an Oscar winning performance. No, I was camouflaging then. I was learning, okay, I was watching this, I was looking at that, and so on. And so the amount of cognition that went into that success was amazing, mm-hmm. that you wouldn't know that that was occurring. It's but still, it, does mean, it still sort of baffles my mind when I think like, you mean neurotypical people aren't always going, where are my eyes looking? And, you know, like, <laughs> are my eyebrows looking raised enough that I look sympathetic? And like, yeah. neurotypical people don't have an ongoing, like, running monologue about that kind of stuff it's still yeah i mean how how would you know the assumption right. is there's a de- defect within you or there's a secret code but you're not into that secret nobody's mm-hmm. explained it to you and the assumption is because you're smart then you should know and if you don't well there's something wrong with you uh without being applauded for actually trying to engage and one of the fears is rejection mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and a lot of autistic individuals have been horrendously rejected that sometimes they're incredibly brave to keep going. And I, I don't know why, but one of the things you said a bit earlier makes me think of how you've actually been, uh, you've been one of the primary voices that I've heard discussing and promoting a more strength-based diagnostic screening. And I mm. so appreciate that thinking because as autistics, we do spend our lives hearing about all the things we do wrong or all the mm. things we're bad at. And, and so I, I spent, I think this was back in, in, was it in 2014 I visited? I think it was. Oh, time is going it's, so it's, quickly. It could it well be. It could um, well but, be. Yeah. But I spent I spent a month uh, observing at your clinic, and one of the things that I remember very vividly was a session where you were presenting um, a diagnosis to a child and going through with the parents and with the child. What are what are mum's strengths and mum's challenges? What are dad's strengths and challenges? What are your strengths and challenges? And and just acknowledging it as this is just a profile, and this particular profile is is called autism, and that means you're autistic, and that's that's great. Wonderful. Yes, congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> yes, it is. And because I yeah, th- that's inspired me so much. Um, Thank you. What made you go that route? By meeting autistic people <laughs> and having autistic people in my family. <laughs> in other words, I'm not a scientist detached. I, 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 I live this. I know it's within my own family. Uh, and so I, I see it from many different perspectives. And, mm-hmm. and the perspective I have is to look at strengths. And when it comes to a diagnosis, I'll actually call it not a diagnosis, but a discovery. This is the day that we have discovered your autism, like we discovered the Beatles or we discovered Vincent van Gogh and, and, and so on. So this is a discovery. And, and I'm I'm saying um, I don't want to change you. I want you to understand yourself and explain yourself to others. That's the challenge. Yeah. You can spend a lot of time teaching social skills and there's going to be a lot of mistakes. My biggest concern isn't autism, it's neurotypicals and what neurotypicals will do to destroy the autistic individual, often for fun or because of ignorance. So uh, to explain yourself, I'm the sort of person who. So it's not to change autism. It's Mm -hmm. very much to explain it to other people. So they go, ah, I've noticed. Now I know why you do that. Oh, that makes sense. That's okay then. So it's finding what aspects of autism are confusing or abrasive to others, interrupting, for example, Mm -hmm. and then to just be aware of those characteristics and be able to explain them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And really understand, uh, you know, I I call my classroom sort of neurotypical 101 because I I feel like I'm, I'm teaching, okay, this is how it's being perceived. They're, like neurotypicals are jumping to conclusions all the time about you. <laughs> and you know, you're not doing anything wrong, you know. And, and, but to have that understanding, I think, allows them to not internalize. Well, they probably already have internalized a great deal of shame and um feelings of of low self-esteem. But this is a way to say, you know, it's not it's not you. And you know, this is this is a miscommunication, the dub, double empathy problem, as as we now know. It, it, it is. And a lot of my clinical work is trying to repair the damage done by neurotypicals in terms of depression, re- fear of rejection, mm-hmm. uh, high levels of performance anxiety socially, uh, social autopsies of the day. Um, and th- this is my concern is the People will say those who suffer from autism. You don't suffer from autism. You <laughs> suffer from what neurotypicals think of you. Autism <laughs> doesn't give you pain in the knees or anything like that. But you do suffer because you feel that you are different. Mm-hmm. And it, the problem is how other people perceive someone who is different. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, you don't suffer from autism yourself. Autism is just the way you think. It's different, different priorities. Uh, I I say, my okay, we got the diagnosis. I have my own 
criteria for autism. Autism describes someone who has found in life something more interesting and enjoyable than socializing. And it's a different way of perceiving, thinking, learning and relating. Um, yeah. And we need it. Um, and, and, and don't fear what is different. Uh, because there are a lot of ad advantages in that. But uh, my concern is the attitude of those to someone who they perceive as different and aren't prepared to try and understand. Yeah. On that note, uh, how do you think um, the, the attitudes of autism professionals have changed towards autistic self-advocates or autistic voices i'm i'm thinking mm. in particular um one of the one of the first autobiographies that that i remember is temple grandin's thinking in pictures but of course mm. she does have a previous book as well um which is from 1986 emergence labeled autistic mm. and I don't know if it's just me, but I, I didn't know about that autobiography until much, much later. And I'm I'm thinking something must have happened in that 10 year time span. Um, and of course, also much earlier. So what, what's been the, the development, you think, of? OK, something which I'm, I'm delighted with is that the voice of autism occurring. It originally began by autobiographies, predominantly women who wrote their autobiographies. Interesting, it, it's, eh? <laughs> it's, not, it's not a men type thing to write your story, um, but a lot of women would write their stories. And in that, I got quotes, descriptions, analyses, and so on that was very good. Now, if you have difficulty understanding people, uh, you watch them, you observe them, you analyze them, you look for patterns and so on. Uh, and people fascinate you. You, you can be an autistic extrovert and you want to socialize but but I, I don't read the signals and it goes wrong but I'll keep going and the person may in their compassion and interest in people mm -hmm. take a career in the caring professions mm -hmm. um, and that's where people say oh it should be information and technology rubbish um, it, it's also in the arts and the caring professions yeah. and so you have somebody who grows up to become a teacher or a psychologist yeah. <laughs> and so what happens is that the person has understood people and has recognized various characteristics and, and want to help people. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues can occur for or, autistic uh, psychologists is a characteristic of autism is being incredibly sensitive to the emotional state of other people. Mm -hmm. And it means that in your day, you're going to meet a lot of people who have a lot of problems and you you mm -hmm. absorb that. you. Uh, oh, yes, it, 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 you soak it up. Uh, and you've got to learn to use a, a sort of a barrier and your intellect, because your compassion is phenomenal, your intellect to say, how can I help this person in a constructive way? Mm. And so uh, what I'm hoping will occur for the future is psychotherapy designed by autistic individuals and for mm. autistic individuals and conducted by autistic individuals. I see an so autistic of, therapist and it's amazing. It's so good. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is. And so that's what I, this is, is I, I welcome into the support team, other autistic individuals. The difficulty is that there can be a risk of only seeing things from your own perspective and your own experiences, but there can be an insight that is extraordinary and a mm -hmm. recognition that I need to explore and become an expert in autism mm -hmm. in general, rather than just myself. And, yeah. and I want to say that I, I really recognize that because I, I do come to the, the profession of psychology with my own experience and in some ways could have probably been a psychologist much earlier than, than I actually was. Mm -hmm. Officially, of course, the, the title and everything. But... At the same time, um, being autistic doesn't mean that you understand the full scope of autism. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's been so important for me in the same way that I think it is for neurotypical autism professionals to really take that time to learn, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, full, the full rainbow, the full, like, tree of autism, all the little branches that are out there and, and recognizing 
that just because you're autistic, you don't know everything. You you still have things to learn about and, autism. And yeah, really, how and, can and anyone? I, I do too. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to well, say, I, how, I think... how... <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> how can anyone really see beyond their own experience unless we are actively trying to? Um, imagine and perspective take so you know just mm-hmm. being autistic doesn't mean you understand everyone who's autistic just like being neurotypical doesn't mean you understand everyone who's neurotypical or, or cr- cross neurotype <laughs> yeah. it, it is but but in that autistic different way of thinking you can come up with solutions that nobody else has thought of mm-hmm. uh, as it's a different way of, of problem solving um when we say think outside the box what box <laughs> and and so what can occur is yes you've got to have flexibility in your perception and understanding the diversity of autism but then an advantage of being able to find a solution to something or see connections that when she said that he said that and she said that and that, ah that tells a lot is being able to perceive things through different eyes which can be very valuable so how do you think the the way that autism professionals um, meet autistic voices has changed like the the way that for example when when I was diagnosed at 16 which is now 20 years ago um I, I don't think that autistic voices were listened to in the same way no. that they are today. No, no, they, they weren't. If they, you, uh, should we say, how would you know you you are disabled? Um, we are superior. We know and uh, we will be very compassionate towards you. Uh, but that's it. Without yeah. re- realizing that it is far better to work together. I'm, I, I'm a from years ago, a Star Trek fan, um, mm-hmm. the original Star Trek. And, and this is Vulcans and Spock. And the Enterprise is far better because Spock's there. So in other words, it's far better um, to be able to uh, embrace the characteristics and use them. This is where I was talking earlier about the strengths. The strengths can occur. There's no career that an autistic person can't excel in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've known many that you would have thought, no, I went, oh, yes, you can, uh, mm-hmm. especially with that degree of determination so i would say it is the the professionals in autism have had to go through a paradigm shift Mm -hmm. of uh, accepting autistic individuals as colleagues not clients Mm. oh i love that and in terms of paradigm shifts of course one of the more recent ones which of course should have happened much much sooner is the shift in recognizing how many, not just autistic people, but people in general, um, are queer, trans, different sexualities from from straight, as we used to assume was the norm. Um, And I, I remember a time when autistic Twitter became upset at some things that you had said, Tony. Um, <laughs> okay, what, what, I, <laughs> what had I said? Um, well, I, I actually ended up making a video about this because the, the two of us had a conversation about that not too long after. And basically it was about, you know, how we need to recognize and actually find a way to, to screen for Uh, and understand why so many autistic people um, fall into these populations. Like, I I think it was a time where J.K. Rowling had also, um, sorry, the author who must not be named, had had mentioned (laughs) that there was an overrepresentation of Mm. trans people in the autism population. And you had been interviewed for, for an article and that publication, it turns out, which I remember us talking about, um, had some political or ideological affiliations that you didn't know about before you no, did the I didn't. What I learned was uh, uh, the naivety of talking to a journalist who mm. does not disclose the hidden agenda. Now, the hidden mm. agenda of the newspaper was very much that this uh, being trans, uh, et cetera, uh, is an aberration. It, it's wrong and 
uh, all those sorts of things. So I had no idea how my comics would be edited mm. to support that particular theme. Uh, mm. I had no say in that. So uh, no, one thing that's, that's something that I've discovered as well. When you talk to journalists, you you don't get to to have any control of how how what you say is edited and presented. No. And sometimes it, it's not necessarily the journalist, it's the sub-editor mm -hmm. who will then edit what the journalist and, and puts it in a yeah. different direction. And sometimes the journalists say, no, 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 that's not, no, nope, that's what goes in the article. Yeah. They have seniority. Yeah. And they know what the editor wants and the editor knows what the owner, the proprietor yeah. wants, yeah. which of has course. its own political religious okay. agenda. So, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I may well have been misquoted, but obviously in my clinical work, I meet many people who question their, their gender, their sexuality, and, and so on. One of the things that I have always explored, in, well, and I think this is very important, mm -hmm. is the concept of who are you mm -hmm. and the recognition of the authentic Self. Now, the authentic self may be different in sense of the convention of, of gender, etc. It, it's who are you? And, and I think mm -hmm. many autistic individuals will explore the sense of self deeper than others may do. Others may do this briefly and so on, but an autistic individual, often as a solitary pursuit, will explore the meaning of life and I don't fit in mm -hmm. and a whole range of things and are mm -hmm. much more self-analytical. Yes. And are looking for explanations that are occurring. It's the overthinking. It, yeah. Sorry? <laughs> yes. Uh, and so what happens is that the person uh, has often come to a decision after a lot of thought that nobody else has listened into. And then for other people, this comes out the blue. Well, actually, they've been thinking about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. And on the journey of transition, they need companions to support them along the way. And that's what we need in that situation. Why? The suggestion is that about one in three of those who are considering changing their gender uh, have autistic characteristics. Why? Uh, we don't know. But as a clinician, I'm there to help them um, mm -hmm. understand who are you, how to cope with that transition, work mm -hmm. with family members too. I find parents generally are very keen on ensuring that their son or daughter are, are happy. Yeah. Um, and also I find that often the peer group are much more supportive than mm -hmm. they would have been 20 years ago. Oh, <laughs> much, yeah. much more. They um, know, they know things like I didn't know things at their age that they know, but I, I, I had a student come out to our class at one point as an asexual demi girl, I think is what they said. And I, I was like, I don't know what half of that is, but, uh, it, you know, it, it, but the students were like, what are, what are your pronouns? And they're, they're young children. Yeah. I actually they are. And there's a new terminology that's occurring. You have to always keep um, up, eh? <laughs> yes. And us old people have a hard time with that. Um, you call yourself old. <laughs> I'm older than you're the youngest person on this call. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, but sort of very Jared. I, no, it, 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 it's, it's interesting we, because I, I actually even I'm I'm just turning 36, and I actually also have a hard time keeping up with with the terminologies. And I, I do find that sometimes I accidentally will use phrases that are that are now um, rude or... It, it is. And, and can I take that a bit further? Because yeah. the, we're looking at changes that have occurred. The original conception was, um, shall we say, person first, then the autism. And mm -hmm. the view was to identify the personality. It's very important. Who is that person who has autism? But what's occurring now is an autistic voice very much in terms of autism first and being very offended yeah. if autism isn't said first. Uh, and there are, there are points on both sides in a way, um, but there are changes that are occurring in expectations. So for example, in research papers now, the, the expectation is to say an autistic person rather than mm -hmm. a person who has autism. Yeah. So this is coming into the academic world, it's coming into the clinical world, etc. What is important is to find out what form of address the autistic person is mm -hmm. uh, comfortable com with, yeah. and, and to and to use that. And it may be different. For example, with my son, well, uh, he prefers person 
first. But for mm-hmm. other people, it's autism first. Yeah. It's a personal decision. And this is actually something that Kara and I have discussed before as well. Um, I don't know if that conversation was recorded, but I, I remember we discussed it. Mm-hmm. It was like, you can use any form of language and it can be respectful or it can be not respectful at all. Um, so it doesn't, for me, it doesn't matter which phrase you use towards me. It matters the tone and the implication of what you're saying. And I do hope, because I I, I understand why the identity first language wave has come along Mm -hmm. and I'm fully on board with it. I I prefer that terminology most of the time myself, but I also think that we do need to get to a place where it's not, it's not whether you're using identity first or person first language that's important. It's whether you respect autistic people as you are using that language. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maya. I think that is very wise. Uh, I've written it down, and I'm sorry, I'm going to steal it. (laughs) (laughs) Because I thought that was so good. Uh, It's the tone. (laughs) Thank you, thank you. I, I, Yes, I I agree. It is the tone that counts. It's the respect. Mm -hmm. It's the attitude that's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And that's why the change is, is... was suggested by autistic individuals to mm-hmm. accommodate the shall we say, or change the the negative perception of autism, which I think is excellent. Uh, but as you say, it's the tone, it's the hidden implications that are going to be important. Yeah, yeah. And I, I hope this is true of all identity groups as well. That you know, we can say we don't know. We're trying. What do you prefer? What what should yeah. what language should we be using? Because language is always evolving. Yeah. Mm. And and people make mistakes in, in language use all the time. And also acknowledging, especially today when so much communication is happening online, you're very likely to encounter people who isn't using their first language. Like English is not my first language. It's not many people's first language. And so, you know, bilingual or multilingual people are more likely to make mistakes in in our language use and to acknowledge that when when people phrase things in a way that you don't like it's it's not necessarily the correct thing to make the assumption that they're trying to be hurtful yes uh i think that's important it it, it what was the thought behind the phrase that was was used and and to um, ask you know yeah. do you mean this or um you know, just respectfully assume that, you know, yes, there are um, cursey word assholes out there, but most people aren't. Most people are good people and they're doing their best. Yeah, I, I think one of the things is it, it, it can be perceived in regard to past experience mm-hmm. where this may have occurred. And oh, they've absolutely. had more than their fair share of yeah. derogatory comments. And one of the things that concerns me and this may be occurring internationally, certainly it is in Australian schools, that the term autistic is used as a derogatory term. Mm-hmm. So if anybody yeah. makes a social mistake, what's the matter with you? Are you autistic or something? Mm-hmm. And I'm horrified at that because then the term autism and autistic is a derogatory term. Yeah. Um, and if we're not careful, that this will become a reason for many autistic te- No. No, I'm not autistic because mm-hmm. they know what their peer group have said to others. I, if autism has been mentioned. Well, and yeah. we see it with other groups too, like gay is thrown around in the same way as a, yeah. as a slur, as an insult. And, and I think there's always movements to reclaim these words to, you know, so that they are not the derogatory meaning. I actually yeah, I mean, had the term gay just originally meant happy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I actually had a conversation with a um, a young person, a teenager, who um, was it was someone who is is um, is trans and autistic, and it was much easier for them to come out as trans to their peer group than to come out as autistic, wow. because wow. being trans right now in that culture. Um, in 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 yeah. that particular peer group in Denmark is mm-hmm. much more accepted than being autistic, and that terrifies me. Um, not that 
not that being trans is accepted. I want that to be accepted, but it yes. terrifies me that being autistic is somehow worse than having any particular gender identity or sexual orientation. Yeah. Like the it discrimination is a major, hurts. Yeah, it, it did, because this is often occurring at the time the person is defining the self. Mm -hmm. And the, the derogatory comment from the peer group means that the, the sense of self is based on criticisms and rejection, not acceptance and compliments. Mm -hmm. And I think those who are critical of autism have no idea of the damage they're doing to people, which becomes their belief, I'm defective. Uh, yeah. And so on, rather than I, I want to be my authentic self, this is who I am, um, because you're the power of the peer group to make or break self-esteem. This this concerns oh, me. And remarkable. I do think there needs to be education uh, all the way through from the moment you're at preschool into diversity and to recognize the differences that are occurring uh, and hopefully to, to recognize as much as somebody's left handed. You know, they're left-handed. So exactly. Now I believe we have to move on to the thing of the day. Okay. So oh. I, I so autistic Twitter has been a lifeline for me. I love it. It's a great way to um spot different neurodivergent traits that you have and understand, oh, I'm not alone in doing it this way. Or and there's so many resources that are shared. And one of them is called How to Talk About Autism Respectfully, a field guide for journalists, educators, doctors, and anyone else who wants to know how to better communicate about autism. And it's by someone named Mykola Bolakonsky. I know I probably butchered that. I am sorry, Mykola, Mykola. Uh, but it goes through many wonderful key takeaways on, uh, you know, autistic people are not a monolith. Interview disabled people. Uh, notice the emotional labor that you're asking. Uh, identity first versus person first. Individual choice matters, which we have talked about a lot here. Mm -hmm. It talks about uh, what is autism and assumptions about autism that have, have been made. Uh, it talks about trust the subjective experience. It talks about there is no severe autism. That's a really interesting part, looking at the language that we've used. It talks about listen to non-speakers. It talks about masking and empathy and intersectionality and a whole bunch of, of things that we are now talking about all the time in the autistic community, but are just beginning to enter uh, other discourses. Yeah, I, I think this is this is important because journalists have a role of educating the community, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, dispelling, but also reinforcing prejudice, etc. Um, one of my concerns is that sometimes autism support agencies will promote disability to get more funding mm -hmm. and, and more tragedy. And isn't this horrible? And we need more government funding, um, which they may need more government funding. But to go about it by saying oh, autism is such a tragic disability is not a good idea for autistic individual. So I, I think it is, uh, as we've gone through, I think today, it, it's a measure of acceptance and, and respect. Mm. And to accept that diversity is a part of, of human life. And if we don't have diversity, there's a wonderful quote, uh, Temple Grandin, and I, I love this one. And she said, if the world was left to you socialites, we would still be in caves talking to each other. <laughs> so I, I think that's very astute. Mm. Well, I also uh, think, too, about criticisms of overdiagnosis of autism um, and I think about those kids who have only heard people saying really negative things about being autistic. And isn't it important that we also capture people who might not have experienced as much trauma, who are, you know, mm -hmm. who, so that we don't just have, um, so that we're representing everyone and so that everyone has images of joy and images of autistic, autisticness in all of its diversity. It does. One of the problems, clinicians see those for whom the wheels have fallen off, but we don't see those who are successful because they don't need psychologists. So we tend to have a skewed view of the future of autism by those who need various forms of support. And yet there are those who may never have had a formal diagnosis, who have the characteristics, but have been very successful. 
And so I'm also interested in, yes, those for whom depression, anxiety, but also those who have made it, who have done it, who have a quality of life. Now, this is one of the things that Maya did recently. I'm going to do a quick plug here (laughs) for Maya and I uh, developing Maya's idea of energy accounting. And in that, we looked and and Maya did a, a survey of quality of life. And what is a quality of life of well-being? And this is asking autistic individuals, what type of lifestyle do you want? It was fascinating and was not necessarily what clinicians would have said. Um, and that doesn't this was surprise access, me. <laughs> yeah, access my special interest to have time alone, all those sorts mm-hmm. of things. And, and that's where it's important to find out uh, it's authentic or autistic happiness, Peter Vermeulen's view. Of, mm-hmm. It's different for different people in autism. It may be a social life that I can cope with, but no more. And at the same time, I feel like a lot of the things people said were actually just expressing human needs. It was like Mm. to to be understood, you know, to express myself and be understood, to feel like I can uh, contribute or I can excel at something I enjoy. You know, it's it's things that that everyone really wants to to have in their lives. It's not autistic. And you just mentioned Peter Vermeulen. And um, one of the things that I really enjoy about him is he always says, you know, there are more things in common between neurotypes than there are differences. Autistic people are, you know, our differences from neurotypicals are much fewer than than the similarities we are just human all of us and I, I think Maya I that, that is the lovely way to end our conversation today I think that that's the best closing remarks for that it might be I don't know <laughs> yeah no I, I I would say I I would like that to be whoever's watching this to be their last thought uh, from our conversation right um, wonderful Well, Tony, thank you so much for making time for us, being here with us, answering all of our questions. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. It it has, because this has been my life. (laughs) And it it seems a little bit indulgent to do that, but it is important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Tony, for, for joining us. And of course, we hope that you're going to come back and join us, maybe... Hopefully when, next year when, when the when book hopefully, is out. Hopefully it'll come out. Um, oh, I, oh, yes. And that would be a good way of promoting the book. Yes. I, I think so. Yeah. And I, I was yeah. a beta reader. I, I really enjoy I I can't wait for it to come out. <laughs> Thank you. We we appreciate your, your reviews on that. For those who have no idea what we're talking about, it's on energy accounting, developed by Maya from her own personal experience. Uh, we're looking at work. We've been working on this together. We're very proud of, of what we've done. Tony's very proud of, of that. Uh, I, 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 I always out. suffer from <laughs> imposter syndrome when whenever I try to present <laughs> these things. And I always feel the need to say, you know, energy accounting isn't something that I came up with out of the blue. It's so many people have had variations of, of this thought and present it beautifully. And this is just our version. And it, it is, I, but it has I been so refined. Okay. It, it's been refined to a level for autistic individuals to really understand. It's a very straightforward process. It's not complex. It's not psychoanalytical or anything like that. But it can be incredibly helpful, especially for stress management, burnout, all those sorts of things. So I think that the book could very significantly improve the quality of life of people. Well, even just, I know you don't want to talk about this now, but we're going to, (laughs) even just the definition of what is autism and the way you weave together the diagnostic criteria, but also through the lens of, you know, it's not that autistic people can't socialize. It's how exhausting it is to do this. Mm. And, yeah. you know, I, I found I was able to read myself in your definition, which often I'm not able to. All right. Okay. Okay, guys, I, I unfortunately have to say farewell at this point, but it's been an absolute delight. The three of us will meet again at some stage in the future. Looking forward yes, to it. <laughs> um, enjoy okay. your day, Tony. Thank you for joining Thanks. us so early in the morning. Thanks.